Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Common Sense with Dr. Ben Carson. I'm your host, Ben Carson. And I have a very special guest with me today, someone whose career I've followed for many years, such a fascinating individual. Uh, his life shows that you should never give up, always follow your dreams, even if your dream changes. He's a Rhodes Scholar, a former NFL player, a best-selling author, a philanthropist, a father, a husband, you name it, that's what he is. And uh, anybody who thinks that they're busy, they ought to talk to this guy. But I can't wait for you all to meet our incredible guest, Dr. Myron Rowe. Uh, welcome, Myron. Being Thank you. Us. Thank you very much for having me. I want to ask you to start. Uh, you've got such an incredible life. Tell us a little bit about life growing up for you. What was that like? Yeah, you know, Dr. Carson, uh, for me, um, my parents came from the Bahamas, and uh, they focused on education early for me and my older brothers. They wanted us to be good citizens, good leaders, good Christian, good men and have a foundation of education. And so they emphasize academic success over athletic success, even though we all like sports. Um, the reward for doing well in school was greater than the reward for scoring three touchdowns on a football field. They still encouraged me and motivated me to do well in football, but you know, if I scored three or four touchdowns on the field, uh, they'd pat me on the back and say, oh, good job. But if I came home with straight A's, they'd give me this real big pizza pie and I can eat it all myself. And I'm the last of five boys and I'm a big guy, I like to eat. So I got to eat it without my brothers interfering with me. So uh, at that point I realized academics were more important than athletics. And I really give it to my parents for putting that foundation in me because it's, it's stuck through high school, college, obviously the Rhodes Scholarship. And now as a chief neurosurgery resident at MGH uh, here in Boston, it's, um, you know, it's worked itself out pretty well. That's amazing. Uh, was it was it difficult uh, when it came to you deciding between Oxford and going to the NFL? How how difficult a decision was that for you? Yeah, you know, Oxford was a it was a difficult decision uh, to choose the Rhodes Scholarship. I um I, I loved a guy named Bill Bradley. Uh, when I went to high school in Princeton, New Jersey, I went to. Princeton University to shoot hoops a couple of times and I would see his statue and his mural up. And I said, this is a guy who's epitome of student athlete. He's somebody who I want to be like. And then I researched him more and I said, oh, you want a Rhodes scholarship? Maybe I can do the same when I get to college. And that's really who planted the seed of, of Rhodes scholarship in my mind. And uh, earning that scholarship was great. But at the same time, the decision between going to Oxford as a medical anthropology master's student, getting that degree, immersing myself in a new culture, meeting new people, or going to the National Football League and deciding to um, make millions of dollars and live out a dream of playing professional football. Very tough choice, but I prayed on it. I asked my family, my friends, people who were closest to me. They said, the NFL is always going to be there. Go get that degree, get that education, get that experience, and then come back to the NFL. And, uh, and I was able to do that, play for three years, keep myself relatively healthy, no broken bones, hands were okay, no concussions, and uh, able to go to medical school and then enter into neurosurgery. And so uh, I, think it, I think it worked out. Tough choice, but one that um, I don't regret making. Your parents were Bohemian. And have you noticed that a lot of Black people who come to this country, who come from other countries, tend to excel to a great degree. What do you attribute that to? You know, uh, I looked at our heritage, our um, family and our structure as a blessing. You know, I, I just, I see my parents, my brothers, names that I know, names that I don't know, leaders as being um, people who have paved the road and set the stage for me. And now it's up to me to maximize this potential that God's given me, that people are trying to cultivate in me. I remember meeting you when I was uh, heading on to Oxford in Silver Springs, Maryland. We went to church together and yes. met with you and Candy. And I, uh, I mean, you've always been a hero of mine and sparked the interest of neurosurgery in my mind. Reading your book inspired me like you inspired many other people in my generation. And uh, I, just, I just knew that like 
having my family's support and having this vision and focus, like the Bible says, where there is no vision, people will perish. Having this vision to be great with the opportunities that we're given was something that uh, I was not going to take lightly. And so even going into all my cases, I had a surgery this morning, as you know, Dr. Carson, um, it was an awake left craniotomy for an oligodendroglioma. And, you know, I prepared for that case like, uh, like I prepared for football games, you know, looking at the CTs, looking at the MRIs, thinking about approaches, thinking about what could go wrong here or there, what would be my approach if something does go, does go wrong. How do I talk to the speech language pathologists in the room and the anesthesiologists, the scrub nurses? Thinking about all these things, this is my time to do well. And I don't mean to make it so grandiose, but there's people who have put a lot of work and effort for me to be here, and it's not my duty to be complacent with this chance. And so something mm -hmm. as beautiful as trying to take out a great tumor in an eloquent area of the brain, trying to mentor somebody, writing a book, leading a family, these are opportunities that people have have sacrificed for me to have. Now it's my job to do the best I can and be the best I can. And I take that very, very seriously. Absolutely. And there's, there are a few things that really measure up to the gratitude that people feel and the fact that you were able to intervene in their lives. I was in the airport in Austin, Texas about four months ago and a man ran up to me and he said, Dr. Carson, Dr. Carson, you won't remember me, but 30 years ago, you operated on my three-year-old daughter who had a malignant tumor, and they said she was going to die. And last week, we celebrated her 33rd birthday. You know, those, those kinds of things are absolutely spectacular, and much better than money and fame, quite frankly. That the Lord gives you the opportunity to do things like that. But what would you say to encourage a very young, bright person who might want to follow in your footsteps, but they say, but I got to go to college for four years and medical school for four years and internship for a year and several years of residency. I'll be an old, old man. What would you say to them? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'd say that um, you don't have to do exactly what I did. Uh, you know, even when I look at your life, Dr. Carson, um, you have made it possible for people like myself to dream big and think big and, and go far. And it doesn't have to be in neurosurgery. I don't have to follow the exact footsteps. Now, I am going into pediatric neurosurgery like you. So, yes, there are similarities. But, you know, um, I, I would tell that young person um, and tell young people who look at my journey, look at our journey and, and say, you know, it's the fundamentals. It's the foundation of things that I would love for you to work on, which is service, right? Uh, the Bible talks about, inasmuch as ye have done for the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So Jesus is saying, the least of these are those who we ought to focus on. So service is important, being selfless and giving of yourself to your community. Um, mentorship. I think mentorship is incredibly important. Leadership, uh, having that principle, the principle of, of faith and loving someone, loving your neighbor like you love yourself, regardless if they look different, come from a different background, have a different last name, come from a different street. That's important. That's about humanity. So if you have these sort of fundamental principles and then you have you put that all together with a formula of the two percent process, which I talk about in my book, The Two Percent Way, about taking small wins every day, small steps towards who you want to be, who you ought to be. Then I think whatever you go into, whether it's NFL football, Rhodes Scholarship, pediatric neurosurgery, politics, or if you just want to be an educator or a police officer or businesswoman, businessman. Having the, 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 the moral constitution and those, those fundamental principles, I think, will set you up for success. And so, um, you know, I talk to young people. I say, don't just do what I did uh, or what I'm doing. I want you to look at my life and see the qualities that um, are admirable to you and put that into your own vision and walk forward and help people along the way. I think that would be uh, the message I'd send to, to people. You mentioned the two percent way, and uh, which was an excellent book, by the way. I had a chance to read it. it was very, I still remember some of the scenes, like the rain in the car, and it was pretty amazing. But um, can you tell us what is the two percent way, and what what inspired you to to go that route? 
Um, the two percent way is a philosophy and ethos that I got from my football coach at Florida State University, Mickey Andrews, my defense coordinator. He's from Ozark, Alabama, and he challenged me and my teammates to get two percent better every day on the field. Two percent better in our stamina, our ability to catch the football, tackle, whatever. Because he wanted us to have these small gains every day, and if we can add them up at the end of the season, we'd be so much better. He'd actually go into the locker room after practice and write on the whiteboard, hey, did Myron Roll get 2% better today? And the guys would vote on it and say, oh, Roll got 1% better today. Roll got 2% better. And it was just a way to keep us accountable. Uh, and I love that mindset because I think often we try to win the world tomorrow. We try to, you know, just take over everything in a day. And it's just impractical and implausible. But if you break life's challenges, your goals, your obstacles are tasked down into small fragments. I think you're able to feel uh, not overwhelmed, feel that you can manage it, uh, feel that you've given yourself that injection of, of good feeling, as you and I know, our limbic lobe is that reward pathway, which can provide us some stimulation when we do well. And just having those small wins every day, there's enough bad in the world, there's enough negativity around us, and if we can just pat ourselves on the back and say, you know what, I got a little bit better today. I'm a little bit better today than I was yesterday. Uh, that feels good. And I've used this approach, the 2% way in medicine right now as being a new father. I have four sets, four kids, two sets of twins, uh, all under the age of three. So big family. I'm learning how to be a dad, learning how to be a husband amidst coming home late from surgeries and, you know, needing to get up in the middle of the night for an emergency or something like that. All these things. I'm working through it. And I needed a formula, a strategy, how to do it. So the book takes you through my life and ties in this message of 2% increase every day. And hopefully people can relate to it. And so far, readers who have seen it uh, have enjoyed it and, and um, you know, find value mm -hmm. in it. So I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of everything that's come out of it. Are you the exception or are your siblings doing well also? Oof. Uh, you know, I'd like to say that I've had um, some outstanding coaches and two parents have been married for 53 years, brothers who love on me, friends who support me. But not everything has gone exactly as I planned it uh, my entire life. Um, you know, I was in court, as uh, you read in the book, and as others who have read it, I went to court for fighting. I had a temper as a young person. I thought that if I did well in school and played well on the football field, that my behavior could be untoward. I could do whatever I want, right? I can act how I want because I'm getting straight A's and I'm scoring touchdowns. You know, what else is there to do, right? <laughs> but there's another part. You got to be a good citizen. And I just, I was stealing. I was skipping school. I was fighting. Um, so not everything worked out the way I wanted to in the beginning. But there was a pivot moment uh, where I came to Jesus. Actually, I gave my life to Christ. and. And I started to make more intentional decisions about my future. And so I, I would say, you know, I don't think I'm the exception, but I, I do feel that I've had support. None of this that I've been able to do in my life, as you can tell by my words and talking to you now, has been alone in a silo. I've mm -hmm. gathered a community, parents, brothers. My wife is phenomenal. She's a pediatric dentist. Uh, she's amazing. Um, you and your wife. I mean, just, I mean, the people who loved me and put into me, that has truly elevated me to a place where I can now look and try to help other people. The book is a part of that. My vocation of being a chief neurosurgery resident at Mass General Hospital is a part of that. Um, my foundation work that I do in the Caribbean, trying to improve neurosurgical infrastructure in low resource settings back in the Bahamas and around the Caribbean, that's a part of that. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a planned effort. And um, you know, when I see young people who are struggling, I say to myself, I need to put a team around them. We got to put a team around them to gather them up and get them up because they have so much potential. They can do really wonderful things. We have to make sure we keep speaking life into them. So um, I know it's a roundabout way to answer your question, but I just see more people as should take the credit for the things that I've been able to accomplish in my life because I didn't do it alone. I've never done it alone. I've always walked together with people and it's, 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 it feels good to have uh, a team outside of the football field, now a team in life that, you know, continues to buttress me forward. Absolutely. Now, you know, a, a lot of our young people are being taught in, in schools these days that they're victims. 
What does that do to a person if they believe that? I believe that uh, there's outlets for people to um, you know, not work as hard, not try as hard. Um, there's outlets for people to sort of fall in the middle of the pack. Um, but I just keep reminding myself that I'm not supposed to be here, right? Like I, I'm the fourth person to match in neurosurgery at Mass General Hospital, one of the oldest hospitals in the country, oldest neurosurgical programs in the, in the country. Everyone likes to have claims to Harvey Cushing. He came through Harvard and, you know, there's just all this stuff that's around here. Fourth black person to match, right? Um, it's not a lot. Out of all the mm-hmm. residents, out of all the attendings. So I, they, they weren't expecting me to be here, right? They weren't expecting my family to be here. They weren't expecting, you know, our, our children to be here with my wife and be able to work as a nurse surgery resident, a pediatric dentist, and four young kids. And, you know, how are, we gonna, how are you guys doing it? There's, there's expectation that people have on you. And I just, I don't like to listen to them. I just say, you know what? I have a great God. I've got a great team, a great family. And I have belief in myself and confidence that we can get it done. So instead of saying the excuse, young people, it's why can't I win it? Why can't I do this? Why am I not able to do what he or she has done? Um, If this person from California or this person from London can get it done, what makes them any better, any different than me? I can do the same as they can. And so that belief is important. I try to pour that into young people. I think that's a good message to sort of provide them with because they have the potential to do it sometimes they limit themselves from doing it because they disqualify themselves before they even get started and you're and you're, and you're like well what's going on so anyway yeah that's uh that's a little bit of my thoughts on that yeah that was uh that was anathema to my mother excuses she never wanted to hear an excuse for anything the next thing out of her mouth was a poem called yourself to blame <laughs> right. and it made made a big difference and she used to always be criticized uh by her friends that she was being too hard on us or that you make those boys stay in the hospital stay in the house and read books and they're going to grow up and hate you and i would overhear them and i say you know they're right mother but we still had to do it and uh you know she got the last laugh because uh one son became a brain surgeon the other became a rocket scientist so maybe there was something to studying and working hard and not making excuses. And uh, I, I love it when I see young people like yourself really emphasizing that. You know, they expect to hear that from an old person like me, but they may not expect to hear that from young people these days, and that's fantastic. But uh, your wife is a pediatric dentist. You've got two uh, highly skilled professional people, and you've got two sets of twins. How the heck... <laughs> How do you manage that? <laughs> well, I have to bring them over to you so you can babysit them. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's a village, and uh, my mother-in-law lives with us. My parents live 20 minutes away. We have a nanny, um, and we just try to be strategic with uh, how we how we take care of them. It's very difficult. It is. It's challenging. And uh, I look at everything in twos now. I'm like, okay, if I do one for one, I got to do something for other. If I throw one in the air, the other one wants to be thrown in the air. Then the other ones want to be thrown. So it's like, this keeps going. Um, but I love it. It's been a blessing. Fatherhood is the best job I've ever had. And, uh, you know, when I come home and they're like, Daddy, I forget about the yelling that my attending does. And, and you know, the nurse not getting what I needed at the right time. I'm like, that, that doesn't matter, right? I'm here. These kids love me and they're smiling. And I'm like, that's... That makes it feel good. That, that makes it all worth a lot. What do you want the average person to get out of reading the 2% way? And I recommend everybody go out and get this book. It is very, very inspiring. You know, the take-home message, I think, from the 2% way is um, that uh, life's going to be challenging. Uh, There are uh, difficulties and obstacles that all of us face, regardless of where you are. That's why I wanted to put my story arc into it, because, you know, even though people can look on the outside and see, well, this guy might have had success at an academic level, athletic level, and now he's in neurosurgery and it's the hardest specialty and he's doing all these things. Looks like his life is unattainable, but the same struggles that 
everyone faces, I face self-doubt, um, you know, challenges in marriage and trying to communicate the right way, um, prejudice, racism, stereotypes, um, being unprepared or underprepared for a task that you have to perform, uh, not being certain of yourself, not feeling like you belong in a certain crowd. I remember going to Florida State, I wore glasses, I tucked my shirt in and my teammates had dreadlocks and gold teeth, listened to different music, ate different food. I was like, I don't think I belong here. But but eventually <laughs> it all worked out. We all worked together towards a common goal of playing football. That brought us together. That was a thing that connected us. Then I go to Oxford and you know I'm this American speaking black man who's there who is supposed to be the representative for Barack Obama because I'm coming from America and everyone's asking me. I'm like, I don't know if I belong here either. And I'm a bit of a jock in this place full of intellectuals. Do I belong here? So the feeling of belonging, feeling of feeling out of place, awkwardness, I felt that. The 2% way gives you an opportunity to break these things down, to, to make it manageable, to reduce the background noise, and to have a formulaic stepwise process into achieving your goal, being the best version of yourself, doing what you need to do for you, your family, your community. Uh, I loved the book. I loved writing it. I had a lot of fun writing it. Uh, I enjoyed you know, putting you know, my words and thoughts on paper and hopefully inspiring people uh, like you have uh, with all of your books. Well, you, you've always had a, a pretty easy time with academics. You're very smart. Uh, in fact, I was looking back at something they said you were the second smartest person in sports or something like that. <laughs> I think they're probably wrong, you're probably the first smartest. But, um, you know, there, there are a lot of people. Uh, I remember when I was in medical school, uh, it was the, the first class in which they had accepted a significant number of black students. And... Uh, about half of them flunked out. Um, do you have some advice for those who struggle? What, what do you think is the cause of some of those struggles? Yeah, uh, you know, I think that um, schoolwork, academic pursuits, um, part of it is motivation, right? You have to keep moving, keep going, uh, regardless of you know, getting a grade or not performing the way you want to on a particular uh, particular examination, but also the part of it is strategy. Like how, how are you finding your best way of studying? Are you a visual learner? Are you a tactile learner? Are you an auditory learner? Uh, do you study in groups better? Are you solo? You know, figuring out what works best for you so you can retain and that, that information and get it through. And then something I tell my mentees all the time, uh, in finishing undergrad, finishing medical school, whatever it is, find your teachers, find your professors. I mean, it may sound like you're brown nosing, but going to them in office hours, speaking to them about what's going to be on the test, what should I study, what supplemental material should I be reading, you know, how can you like how have other people in the past done well in your class? What have you seen work for you? I'm telling you, I, they 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 see the initiative, and then you also get a bit of a leg up and some of the tips and tricks that you can use to help yourself uh, forward. So I think uh, academic pursuits is, yes, you have to have the mental machinery to do it, but then there's finding out how you study best, knowing yourself best, and then finding those strategies to, uh, to get through. It can be difficult, but Absolutely. you can do it. You definitely can do learn, it. Learn how you learn. And uh, absolutely right. Everybody has their method. And, you know, when I was a first year medical student, my advisor said, drop out, uh, you're not cut out for medicine. But, uh, you know, I discovered how I learned. And once I learned that, the rest of medical school was a snap after that. And everything else was too. And of course, uh, most of our learning is done outside of the classroom. And once you learn how you learn, you can apply that to the rest of your life and become a lifetime learner. And those are the people who tend to really make a difference in our society. Well, I'm sure you're going to be one of those people. You're already making a difference. You've already inspired at this stage so many people. And uh, that's an amazing story. You have a parting word for our audience. One, I would say, if, if anyone doesn't know my, my history and, and how I actually got into this, I mean, you know, 
Dr. Carson, you have been uh, tremendous for me. Um, you've been the, the sort of the green light and the great Gatsby, you know, you've sort of been that green light out there that's like, man, I got to get there. I want to be as inspirational, as influential, as phenomenal as him. Uh, I've always wanted to. Have a chance to meet you, know you, know your wife, your children. It's been a blessing. Um, I would say, you know, for people who are um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where they're questioning themselves, questioning where they should be. One of my favorite scriptures or one of the favorite stories in the Bible is of Esther, where she is, um, you know, in a position, sort of like the first bachelorette of the Old Testament. And uh, she's in a position to do wonderful things. And her cousin Mordecai continues to tell her, look, you know, your husband may come and slaughter us, but um, you were placed there for such a time as this. Like, you have a purpose. This place, this space where you are right now, you belong here. You, you worked hard to be here. Uh, don't forget that. Such a time as this, this is your time. This is your moment. And so for those who are thinking through what they want to do next in life, thinking through challenges, remember that you're here for a purpose. You're here for a reason. You belong here. You have a role. And you'll do it well. Find the ways to do it, whether it's 2% way or whether it's reading something else or whether it's being inspired by somebody else, whatever the case may be. Know that, um, you know, you're destined to do great things and believe it in yourself. I've done that my entire life. I've never once thought that I wasn't supposed to be here. Even when I felt awkward around certain settings, I said, you know, there's people who put me here, sacrificed me to be here. God ordained this where it is right now. Let's get it done. Let's fire it up. Let's be the best we can be. Let's maximize this moment so that, you know, other people can be blessed and helped along the way. And uh, so that would be my parting words. But thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much to you for setting that light for me and so many others. Uh, you are amazing. You've always been amazing. I always, your name is first on my lips when people ask, why did you go into neurosurgery? Uh, you and Dr. Jay Storm, uh, who you know very well, who's at CHOP. Uh, he is somebody else who's really been an inspiration for me. And, um, and obviously with the stuff going on with concussion and CTE, I've, I've been able to straddle football and neuroscience in a way that keeps my love of football alive in my heart uh, with also doing the things I'm doing now in uh, neurosurgery. So anyway, thank you very much. I really do appreciate you for having me. Well, it was great having Dr. Myron Rowe with us today. What an amazing young man who shows that it's never too late to accomplish your dreams. And with hard work, dedication, and faith, there's almost nothing that you can't accomplish, regardless of what obstacles are there in the way. We all have obstacles, no matter who you are. I can guarantee you, Bill Gates has obstacles too, a lot of them. Uh, Elon Musk, obstacles too. Money doesn't keep you from having obstacles. But what does is how you approach them. And whether you allow those to dominate you or whether you will use each one of those obstacles as a hurdle to strengthen you for the next obstacle that comes by. So your prescription for this week is just to be encouraged and to look at those obstacles and make sure you make a little step forward in overcoming them. Like it says in the 2% way from our guests today, little progress at a time. It's just like, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And that's our program for this week. Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts from. Make sure that you rate us, review us, tell your friends about us, because we need to spread common sense. It is so critical we look around us and we see just crazy stuff happening. And we have a brain for a reason. And let's use it. And remember the cornerstone principles. Faith. Liberty, community, and life. See you next week.